So we are going to continue to look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter, well, we're going to begin to look at chapter 4, but we're going to look at 2 Timothy. Before we do, I want to, uh, first let me explain my theology. I think you can honor God by sitting or standing or standing on your head, but if you want, please stand and we'll recite uh, the uh, memory verse together from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. <clears throat> okay. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay. Did you get ESV there? Thank you, Ma. <clears throat> okay. So uh, this is, it seems like this is the last writing that the Apostle Paul did. This is kind of his collection of his last words, at least to Timothy. Uh, last words are an interesting uh, concept. I was looking up uh, Francisco Pancho Villa, the uh, revolutionary bandit, good guy, bad guy, uh, who actually helped, tried to help uh, liberate uh, Mexico and turn it into a democratic state. He was unsuccessful, basically. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, he was known to be a great orator. He could speak, he could write. Uh, except when he came to the end of his life, he had nothing to say. Uh, bullets were fired on, on the vehicle he was in. He was dying, and he turned to his friend, and he said, this can't be the end. Tell them I said something. So he kind of ran out of words there, you know. Tell them I said something. So he said something. But uh, sometimes last words can be uh, more meaningful. Uh, my dad died about six years ago, uh, about six months after my mom died. But anyway, he, uh, I was talking to him with my oldest daughter, Rachel. It turned out my oldest daughter was the last daughter to get married. And my dad knew that, and he was concerned. <clears throat> and so he had talked to us a lot about how happy he was married to my mom. And that was obvious through our lives, by the way. And so then he turns to Rachel, and he says, have you ever, are you dating somebody? And she said, yes, I am. And his last words in that conversation, some of his last words were, don't miss any opportunities. Because he was so enamored with the marriage relationship he had with my mom, and so he wanted Rachel to do that, and indeed, the guys she was dating, uh, they are now married up there in Chino Valley with uh, two uh, grandchildren. So that kind of fits in a, I guess, if you will, earthly way, the don't miss any opportunities with what the Apostle Paul says in a much more spiritual way as he writes to Timothy. So keep in mind, uh, Paul is in a Roman jail. It's gotta be a little discouraging, chained to a guard. It seems like for the last maybe three years of his life, he was chained to a guard. Uh, that's, not, that's, that's kind of discouraging. And yet he writes, I think, what is a relatively encouraging book here uh, to Timothy, this second letter to Timothy. So he has this dear friend, he's writing to him, and he concludes that letter here, the beginning of the conclusion at least, in chapter 4, uh, by telling him that Timothy is called to accurately, urgently, compassionately, and wisely proclaim the word of God. That word that we saw in uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 Paul wants to make sure that Timothy is passing that along. He wants to make sure that Timothy knows it's his turn. It's his turn to proclaim the word of God. Let me read you the opening verses there of 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So that's how he opens it up. And this concept of charging him, uh, he's not using charge as they do militarily or in terms of a credit card. He's used, it's actually the word that we get testify from, except it's got a, uh, a preposition in front of it. Uh, the typical way that the Greeks changed a word is they put a preposition in front of it. So this is a special, I am testifying to you, and I want you to testify. And obviously what he's to testify about, uh, 
is concerning proclaiming the word. You may say, well, you know, I don't preach. Hopefully I don't either. Hopefully I just teach kind of. Preaching wasn't always my favorite idea. But this, it just means proclaim, communicate in kind of a upbeat way. Proclaim the word of God, the word of God that is good for teaching, reproof, correction, etc. That's what we are to communicate. But we're not just to communicate it, we're to, to live it. And by the way, he says this isn't a seasonal thing. It's always the season to uh, communicate God's word and to look for opportunities to communicate God's word. Uh, simple ways, uh, saying I'm blessed rather than to say I'm fortunate, uh, things like that. And obviously even deeper ways of, of telling somebody about a scripture that has meant something to you. Those are ways that we can proclaim the word of God. I want to uh, look at just one word in this list. It's a word uh, that occurs here concerning what the word, what he wants God's word to do through Timothy to his, uh, to the church. He's, the, he's the, at least one of the pastors of the Ephesians church, Ephesian church. And the word I want to look at was the word there that's my version translates uh, exhort. Um, it's difficult to translate that word because it means at least four things in English. And so it's translated various ways. Uh, it's the word that Jesus used as the Holy Spirit. It's transliterated into English as paraclete, the one called alongside is the idea. So uh, the one called alongside, that's kind of generic, but this translation says exhort. And exhortation is something we do when we're you know, alongside somebody, exhort them, encourage them. Encourage is another uh, meaning for this word. So it means exhort, encourage, but it also means to comfort. And that's what we can look for the word of God to do for us, and that's what he expects Timothy will teach, communicate, proclaim concerning the word of God, that it's, uh, it's an exhortation, it's uh, a comfort, it's an encouragement, it communicates that God is still with us. Remember, Jesus was called Emmanuel, God with us. But when he left, he said, you know, I'm going to send you another comforter. There's that word, the paraclete. And that comforter is the Holy Spirit. He indwells us when we put our faith in him. But he also is beside us, alongside us, to offer us these various encouragements and comforts. Well, this is not a new teaching that the Apostle Paul is giving but rather it's, it's consistent with the Old Testament. <clears throat> Going back millennia, uh, Israel was in Egypt about 400 years. Apparently the last 150 years, they were in slavery to Egypt. God freed them from that slavery, took them to the promised land. And when he took them, took them to the promised land, when he did that, he wrote, well, he caused Moses to write various of the five books of the Pentateuch, including and concluding with Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy gives a, a lot of teaching concerning how Israel was to, well, for one thing, preach the word, but they were to do so by, by the way they lived it. And I kind of look at Deuteronomy as, that might be one of the last books I want to look at. It's very deep. It's got, seems like, significant amount of repeti uh, repetition. But I'm encouraged to, to read it, to understand it, because when I think about, you think about Jesus' temptation, what, the four temptations from Satan, do you know how he answered those temptations? He answered them with scripture. Do you know every one of those scriptures came from Deuteronomy? If you had to defend yourself from temptation, would you be able to do it with the knowledge you have learned from Deuteronomy? Would you be able to quote Deuteronomy to resist temptation? Well, that's what Jesus did, and I have to admit, I could probably name one or two verses, but I probably couldn't name the four, uh, especially the ones that Jesus did. But it's in Deuteronomy that we have this initial concept of communicating the word of God. Let me read to you uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. It has a baton in it. Actually, it doesn't. So Moses writes according to God's command. He says... These words I am commanding you, and they are to be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit down in your house, 
when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. So there is this, especially in reference to children, but there is this constant habit, commitment, priority. I'm going to communicate God's word. That's preaching the word. When I sit down, when I rise up, when I lay down, when I go out of the house, when I sit down, I'm going to communicate God's word. It is a lifestyle more than a preaching exercise, okay? It is how we are called to live, communicate God's word. And I think it's those verses from Deuteronomy that perhaps the Apostle Paul was thinking of when he told uh, Timothy to preach the word. So Paul's in prison. He is... uh, He's got to be a little discouraged, okay? But I wonder how discouraged he is because he's very encouraging in the words he writes to Timothy. But he's telling Timothy, you know, you need to step up. It's your turn. This is your opportunity. Your time has come. And he wants to commit him to proclaiming, to preaching, uh, passing on uh, the word of God. That's Paul's major message to Timothy as he's leaving. And as I've noted before, uh, Paul must have done a pretty good job at communicating God's word to Timothy because Timothy did a good job of communicating it to the Ephesian church because the Ephesian church lasted 900 years. Not bad. 900 years through some of the kind of darkest times of history, the fall of the Roman Empire, all of that, um, the Middle Ages. That church, the Ephesian church, which is in what is now Turkey, but... uh, That's the church that lasted 900 years. It was, I mean, it had a lot of help. There was Timothy there as a pastor. Paul had uh, written a letter to it. Apparently, the apostle John stayed in Ephesus for a while. And, uh, of course, one of the churches uh, that he says Jesus writes to them uh, is, uh, of the seven churches in Revelation, is uh, the church at Ephesus. So Ephesus is an important city, but here... Paul wants to make sure that that important city, that metropolitan area that has a church in it, that Timothy, maybe the pastor, maybe one of the pastors there, that he has this encouragement, this information, that indeed God's word transforms lives. You need to communicate God's word. And of course, the apostle Paul says that elsewhere. Romans 12, you know, commit your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Don't be conformed to this world but rather be transformed. The word of God, when taken into the human heart, transforms people. You know, I I look at my life and I think, well, how in the world did the word of God transform me? And if I just kind of lightly look at it, honestly, there's no transformation. But one of the verses that has really transformed my life is also written by Paul. It's in uh, Philippians chapter 4. And I'll just sum it up for you, but what, it's, what it says is the things in your life that are falling apart, turn them over to God in prayer and then seek for one thing where God is, and I can't get the exact words, but uh, you know where God is doing good in your life. Let your mind dwell on those things. Uh, besides coming to faith in Christ and being saved, those verses changed my life. Those verses uh, led me to less worry about money, led me to less worry about all kinds of things, and led me also to uh, uh, forgive people that uh, had harmed me. So those verses changed my life. There is a transforming power in the word of God. And part of the reason is the Holy Spirit is not only indwelling me, but he's he's beside me. He's giving me guidance, direction, as long as I'm willing to accept it. So it's just important to realize that Paul is communicating the word of God. He's communicating it to Timothy in these last words. And then he's telling him, you need to pass it on. It's your time to take the baton and to run with it. So just in summary, Paul writes, proclaim the word of God. Do it accurately. Do it with urgency. Do it with compassion. Do it with wisdom. And proclaim it all the while, trusting in the God who stands beside you. That's one thing that we can, that I can at least comfort myself with. If I feel all alone, the reality is God stands beside me. And that's, that's meaningful to me. Um, I hate to admit for all kinds of faults, but I used to be afraid of the dark. I mean, I know that's kind of silly, but I was afraid of the dark. And then I took up hunting. Well, guess what? You hunt at dusk and you return to the car in the dark. And there are noises and there are critters. 
And I said, God, it's a good thing you're beside me because I'm kind of scared here. But anyway, I've learned not to be afraid of the dark. I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. I am kind of now because I only have one eye that works and I tend to trip. But in general, I'm not afraid of the dark. So you say, well, that's not very transformational. I am convinced that if you'll take in the word of God, it will transform you and it will change you for the better because God stands with you and God has his word and his spirit uh, to guide us. So Paul has outlined the tremendous benefits of God-breathed scripture. Now, <clears throat> some versions, by the way, in 2 Timothy 3 say, the word of God is inspired. And we always talk about the ins, we, we, us scholarly theologians, talk about inspired. Dare I say, as a heretic, the word of God is not inspired. Because inspired means the words are there and God puts spirit into them and suddenly they're wonderful. No, that's not what happened. It's God breathed. As the writer wrote down the word of God off his pen, it was the word of God. It was God breathed. God breathed out those words through the human authors. That's what that word says. It doesn't say he plugged his spirit in after they were written. They were his words from the beginning. They are God breathed words. And it's funny because the apostle Paul gets creative there because God breathed is one word in the Greek, but this is the only place it occurs. Paul couldn't think of a word that described what the scriptures were, and so he made up a word. He says, it's God-breathed, and that also is God-breathed. So this is, this is God talking to us. Now, we may like to hear his voice, but the reality is, if you want to hear God talk to you, read his words. He's talking to you. It's important because it comes from God, and it is transformational. So Paul wants Timothy to communicate the benefits of the word of God, the transformational power. He wants to do so accurately, widely, broadly. And we're called to do the same thing. We're supposed to communicate the word of God because it changes us. Um, I guess my concern is that you might still be thinking, I'm not a preacher, you do that. I'll live my life. But let me remind you that four times Jesus tells his followers, if I can stretch it a little bit, that they're to preach the word. He says that in the Great Commission. Let me read to you the Great Commission from, uh, what am I going to read it from? Oh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. That's a good one. It's in all four Gospels. It's also in Acts. You know, we're to go, therefore. And by the way, the word go is not an imperative. You're into grammar. The imperative says do this. It doesn't say go. It says as you are going. The assumption is you're going to be going around in this world. So as you're going, living your life, what do you do? Make disciples. That's the only command in that whole verse. Make disciples. I think Acts uses, uh, be my witnesses. That's what we're to do. Does that include going? Yeah, because as human beings, we tend to be going. Going here, going there, more so in the 21st century. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you, I'm beside you, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So there's the command commission to all of us. You may say, I don't preach the word, but the reality is if we're doing what God wants us to do and making disciples, we do that by preaching the word. We might do that without saying a word. We might do that by saying a lot of words or a few words, but we're communicating the word of God that changes us and changes others as well. So Paul then moves from this powerful, transforming word of God, and he says, here's why it's urgent to do so. And if he's telling Timothy it was urgent then in the first century, I'm thinking it's more urgent now because the things that Paul foresees if they hadn't yet occurred in the first century, they have certainly occurred now. Notice what he says, why the proclamation is urgent. He says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. The word there, sound, is just healthy. It's healthy teaching. It's life-giving teaching. We're to take that in. And people will tend not to. They have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. By the way, if you ever want to uh, 
it, it's so ironic. You know, you go to court and what happens? Well, there's one psychologist that says, hey, this guy's nuts. Another guy says, no, he's fine. You know, there's, you can find the person to say what you want to hear. Uh, doctors, too, unfortunately. You need something to say, I know what's wrong with me, doc. No, you don't. Go to another doctor. You'll find a doctor that will agree with you. It may take more money, but you'll find one that will agree with you. Our world is looking to suit their own passions. And they may be somewhat or completely legitimate passions, but that's not what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to live in a way that suits our own passions. He wants to live in a way that demonstrates his passion, which is his love for a lost world. These people will turn away from listening to the truth. They'll wander off into myths. And uh, does that say felt fake news? No, it just says myths. But it's the, sa it's the same thing. He says, but you be sober-minded, endure suffering. That's disappointing. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So Paul says, don't be looking for your own passions and priorities. Rather, do mine. Do God's, if you will. He says, so people are going to kind of wander away from the truth. For some people, I'm convinced that the truth is unrecognizable. They are strangers to the truth. That doesn't mean that in some sense we don't try to communicate truth to them, but we are in the world that I think the Apostle Paul is predicting here. People follow after myths. They're following things that are just frankly not true, but God's word is true. One of the curious things he commands Timothy to do as Paul continues to write, he says, do the work of an evangelist. That's interesting because it seems like, being he's the pastor of a church, Timothy is probably, can we guess, has the gift of being a pastor, pastor teacher. But nowhere does it say that Timothy has the gift of evangelism. But Paul doesn't say, exercise your gift in his evangelist. He says, do the work of an evangelist. Give good, evan evangel, good news. Give good news to people. Live good news to people. Speak good news to people. He says, do that. And I'm convinced that's not just for Timothy, that's for all of us. Whatever our gifting is, and we all have spiritual gifts, make sure you're doing the work of communicating God's good news. Hopefully we're communicating it because it's good news to us. It's the best news I've ever heard. And it's a news that transforms, changes my life, makes me, by the grace of God, a better person. So the priorities of many people is, as Paul says, to accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. They will turn away from listening to the truth. They'll wander off into myths. By the way, you all know the Greek word for myths. You know what it is? Myth. So there you go. You got it. You just learned Greek today. So rather than submit to the truths of Scripture, they would rather turn to things that just aren't true and take them as if they're true. So Paul's urgency is highlighted by this drift of humanity towards other than the truth. Uh, it was ironic. I, I was a chaplain at an inpatient drug rehab place uh, for about 12 years, and I wasn't allowed to say the Bible, because it was an AA sort of thing. And so I was there for a long time, and one of the reasons was I was there, I guess I'd been there about five years on there, Lord, I am not even allowed to give the gospel to these people. I can't give them the direct good news. Well, God kind of answered that prayer, and he said, stay there, because a young lady came in. I don't know how old she is, but gosh, she's probably 40 now. But uh, she came in, and she looked horrible, okay, which was kind of typical. She had been, I don't know, I think it was alcohol, and it just did horrible things to how she looked. You couldn't even see her face. Her hair was like this. And so I spoke to her, if you will, off camera. And I said, uh, you know, the reality is that you've looked for the God of your understanding. That's what AA says. But I want you to look for the God that is truly there, the God who cares personally about you. She didn't really respond. So the next Sunday, I came back to the chapel service, and I didn't recognize her. She'd combed her hair, cleaned herself up. I thought, whoa. But anyway, long story short, long story. But uh, we had our time of sharing. I shared my devotional that had scripture in it. I just didn't say, hey, James 1, here it is. I just said it. So, <clears throat> and then I talked about, you know, we need to follow the God of our understanding, baloney, baloney, baloney. She raised her hand and she said, her name is Angela. She said, uh, you know, this is my fourth rehab, four to six weeks each. She says, and up until now, she said, I sought the God of my understanding, and he wasn't there to help. 
But he said, she said, this week I have put my faith in Jesus Christ and he's made a difference in my life. I didn't have to preach the gospel. She preached the gospel. Four days a Christian and she's preaching the gospel. So that convinced me to stay there. If God wanted the gospel directly and perfectly preached, he could use somebody there, even if I wasn't allowed to preach the gospel. So the gospel, the good news, changes people. We can be good news. And it doesn't just necessarily just change us physically. It might not change us physically at all. Uh, but it will change us from the inside out. It will make us the people that God called us to be. It will allow us to live up to our potential. Paul's urgency is also highlighted by his impending execution. He knows that it's been ordered that he's going to die. Uh, he's following a, a cult, in their opinion. You were allowed to be Jewish, you just weren't allowed to be Christian because that was a cult of Judaism as far as the emperor was concerned. The emperor was not a nice person. And um, so that highlights why it's urgent for Timothy to get this letter, to read it, and to abide by the scripture. Notice what Paul writes <clears throat> in reference to his impending execution. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith and henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. So the concept of a drink offering is maybe strange to us because that's an Old Testament concept. I think the first drink offering poured out was Jacob. He was thankful that he was alive, that God had given him promises, and so he took some portion of wine and poured it on the ground. Cool. But then the drink offer, offering became, it was the last sacrifice given when the whole list of sacrifices were given the drink offering. And Jesus kind of explained that more clearly. He said, my blood is about to be poured out. Take it and drink it, all of you. Partake of it. Partake of my drink offering. And of course, Jesus' blood was poured out when they plunged that spear into his side. It was the ultimate, the final drink offering. But we're called to remember him because of his drink offering. But Paul says, my death is a drink offering. It's the last thing I'm doing to show that I love God, to show that I want to communicate his word. It's, it's what he lives for. It's what he dies for, to pour out his life as a drink offering. And that's kind of making the most of an opportunity, the opportunity to, to live for God, uh, recognizing that ultimately there's going to be this sense that God is a righteous judge. And that's a little scary. God's the judge. Yeah, he's the judge. But I try to look at it this way, and sometimes I can't, but sometimes I can. If there is no ultimate judge, if you're atheist or agnostic, you say, well, that's the way life is. Maybe we get karma, maybe we don't. But there's no guarantee of justice. And another thing there's no guarantee of, if there's no justice, there's no accountability. The reason we're judged is to hold us accountable. If you're not accountable, you don't count. You're just wandering around in a myriad of molecules. It's meaningless. But the reality is it's not meaningless because there is a judge. He will judge. He'll hold us accountable, Paul says elsewhere. And this worries me. For every, what is it, uh, casual word that you speak. I speak too many casual words. But... The reality is that there's going to be a judgment, even for those that trust Christ. It's not a judgment of you're lost or you're saved. It's a judgment of reward, as the Apostle Paul communicates here. He says, I expect to receive a crown of righteousness because I look forward to the presence of Christ with me. I have the Holy Spirit alongside of me, but I look forward to the presence of Christ. I would say the only way to look forward to the presence of Christ is if you've already put your faith in him and say, Lord, I want my life changed. Things fall apart in such difficult ways that I can't change them, I can't fix them, and they need to be changed, and they need to be fixed. God can get you perfectly involved in that process of changing you. And then if you're like me, you'll learn that I can change me, but I can't fix others. And that's important to learn. But God can fix anybody, anything. <clears throat> 
There is no repair needed that God can't fix. That's what he's the expert healer on, to fix things, to fix human beings, to fix relationships. And as I depend on him, he does that. So we're called, I would say, to put our faith in Christ so that we have the option and understanding to communicate God's good, good news. Uh, but if, it, if you haven't received that good news, it's kind of like you're proclaiming it as a stranger to it. Don't be a stranger to the good news. If you haven't, even today, put your faith in Christ. Say, Lord, I believe that you died for me, that you rose again, that you're going to call me to heaven, and that right now the Holy Spirit is in me. He walks beside me to encourage me, to comfort me, to give me guidance and direction so that I can be the person you've called me to be. It's, it's the most important decision I ever made to put my faith in Christ. I encourage you to do that. And then I encourage you to not only live and speak the good news, but to encourage others to do, do the same, to make the most of the opportunities that God provides. I regularly pray, Lord, let me see the opportunities you put before me and let me make the most of them. That's our goal. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, to, do teach us to proclaim and communicate your transforming word. Lord, your word, it does change us. It makes us people you've called us to be. It gives us, it ultimately, as we accept it, gives us eternal life. Lord God, help us to make the most of every opportunity we have to live for Jesus every day, to follow your principles and to uh, reflect the love of Jesus to everyone that crosses our path. We ask you, we thank you, we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.